Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. And all of the work that I'm talking about today is joint work with Carolyn Abbott and Dennis Osen. So one of the techniques that we use in geometric group theory to try and understand the behavior of groups better is to consider actions of our group on metric spaces, see what that group action looks like, and try and derive information about our group from that action. So for the purpose of this talk, when I talk about a group action, I mean a triplet, G, S, and phi, where G is a group, S is a metric space, and this map phi from G into the set of isometries of S is a homomorphism. So in particular, actions for me are always isometric actions. So they're distance preserving. And the notation that we use is G acts on S where the map phi tells us exactly how elements of our group are mapped to isometries. And we sometimes just completely omit the phi if the action is obvious. And the other notation that we use is an element g of our group acts on an element s of our space. This is understood to be the image of s under the isometry that g maps to. Okay. Now, actions of our group can be of different types. So G acting on S could be, first of all, co-bounded if there exists a bounded subset of your space, S, such that translates of this bounded set B under the action of the group cover your entire space. An action is said to be proper if for every bounded subset B of our space S, the number of elements of our group G that move or translate this ball in a way such that the translate intersects the original set is finite. There's no assumption about there having to be a uniform bound here. It just needs to be finite for every bounded set. And lastly, the action is said to be geometric if it is both proper and co-bounded. Okay. Now, luckily for us, for groups, there exist very natural metric spaces on which our group acts. And this is the Cayley graph of our group. So if we are given a generating set of our group G, let's call it X. And when I talk about generating sets, I don't necessarily mean just finite generating sets. I also consider infinite generating sets. Then associated to this generating set and this group, I can build a Cayley graph denoted by gamma GX, where vertices of my Cayley graph are elements of my group G. And G is connected to the element GX by an edge labeled by an element X from my generating set. And what you can observe is that the group has a very natural action on its own Cayley graph, which acts by left translations, where the interaction is, of course, precisely the interaction of the elements of the group. And the other thing to always notice about the action of a group on its Cayley graph is that the action is always co-bounded. Because this Cayley graph can be written as the union of translates of the identity. right? Because if I take a group element and I act it on the identity, I get precisely that group element. And so this covers the entire vertex set of my graph. Okay, So this action is always co-bounded. Now, obviously, we have some choice here to make as to the generating set of our group. Okay? If I pick different generating sets, my Cayley graph will look very different. For example, if I pick Z and I pick its standard generating set, which consists of the single element 1, 
then my Cayley graph looks like an infinite line. And this is a useful Cayley graph for me to be looking at. Why? Well, first of all, I can immediately see that this Cayley graph is hyperbolic. It very nicely depicts to me the cyclic nature of my group. And the natural action of z on this Cayley graph, which is just by shifts to the left or the right, is both co-bounded and it's also proper. So we have a geometric action. OK, so we know our group z is hyperbolic in particular. And I can also see that it's going to have two endpoints, two points on the Gromo boundary of this hyperbolic space. On the other hand, if I looked at the generating set of my group, which consists of every element of my group, so I have an infinite generating set, the corresponding Cayley graph is just a bounded set of diameter 1. Because between any two group elements, I have an edge connecting them, which is labeled by the difference between those two integers. But this is not a very useful Cayley graph for me to be looking at. It's just a bounded space. It's quasi-isometric to the point. It tells me nothing about the nature of my group. It practically forgets the inherent structure of my group. And so we could say that this is a better generating set to be looking at as compared to this generating set. And that's the idea we'd like to formalize. We'd like to say, formally, given two generating sets, when we can say one is better than the other. So the definition is let x and y be two generating sets of g. We say, firstly, that x is dominated by y. So this is not actually an e less than or equal to symbol. It's kind of like a curved less than or equal to symbol. Um, but how we read it for generating sets is that x is dominated by y if the supremum taken over elements of y and rewritten in the language of x is finite. Okay? And what that means is that every element of the generating set y, when I try to rewrite it in terms of the generators of, of x, there is a uniform bound on, on how many elements it will take me to do that. And this is a pre-order relation which defines an equivalence relation in a very natural way, which I, think, which I think you mentioned in your talk today, that we say x is equivalent to y if x is dominated by y and y is dominated by x. And this is actually equivalent to the condition that the Cayley graph of our group generated by x and the Cayley graph with respect to y are actually quasi-isometric to each other. The identity map on vertices of this graph, which maps g to itself, extends to a quasi-isometry. And the map is obviously surjective. So you get that for free. And what we can do with this is define a set g of g, which is the set of equivalence classes denoted by square brackets around x of generating sets of my group G. No, infinite generating sets are allowed. Yeah? Oh, this is the word length of y in the generating set x. Okay. All right. Now, there are some things to notice about this definition. First of all, if your group has a finite generating set, then all finite generating sets are equivalent to each other because the supremum just turns into a maximum. And that's always a finite number. The other thing to notice about this definition is that it is inclusion reversing. So if x and y are generating sets of my group, but y is the bigger set, then it implies that as a generating set, it's less helpful to me to look at. And the reason is, well, first of all, if x is a subset of y, then this supremum is just going to be 1. 
So I can see why y should be less than or equal to x. The other reason it's useful to have it this way is that it's consistent with the observation we made over here. The generating set g consisting of every element is sort of the worst to look at. So with respect to this preorder, we want it to be the smallest, which is why it makes sense for me to have it being inclusion reversing. And now I'm ready to define what is a hyperbolic structure on a group. Okay? A hyperbolic structure on G is an equivalence class taken from G of G such that the corresponding Cayley graph is hyperbolic. And it is OK for me to define it this way, because we've learned that hyperbolicity is a quasi-isometric invariant. So if I have two Cayley graphs that are quasi-isometric to each other, their generating sets fall in the same equivalence class, and one of them is hyperbolic, well, I also know the other Cayley graph is going to be hyperbolic. So it's OK for me to write it this way. And we denote the set of hyperbolic structures on our group by h of g. And we take the same preorder on it that's induced from g of g. Now, the reason it's called a structure is because this generating set gives us up to quasi-isometry a rigid structure on our group, which you can see in the Cayley graph. That's the reason it's called a structure. The other thing to observe about h of g is that its elements are actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with equivalence classes of co-bounded actions of my group g on hyperbolic metric spaces. Now, when I say this, I'm glossing over a lot of details. The first thing you might ask is, how are you defining the equivalence just for actions? And even though it's not something I need for the rest of the talk, I'll just mention it, that the equivalence on actions, at least for co-bounded actions, is that you have a coarsely G equivariant quasi-isometry between the spaces on which your group acts. So when I say coarsely G equivariant, I mean there is a finite bounded error up to which this quasi-isometry respects the actions of your group on your two spaces. So it can't do something in one action and then do something widely different in another action. It has to respect it up to some bounded error, which is uniform. OK. And the second thing that I'm glossing over here is how do you get this one-to-one -one correspondence? Well, this is actually a consequence of the milner swark lemma. Now, I think when you saw the milner swark lemma in one of the lessons last week, you saw it very specifically in the context of geometric actions on hyperbolic spaces. Well, the truth is that the same proof of the milner swark lemma goes through in this case as well. Omitting the condition of having a proper action simply means that you can no longer conclude that the corresponding generating set is finite. That's what properness allowed you to do in that proof. It allowed you to say that the generating set that we have, because it had to shift this ball non-trivially, had to be finite. That's all that we lose when we just drop the condition of properness. We still get a generating set because of the co-boundedness of the action. And that's precisely what gives us this one-to-one -one correspondence which is order preserving, in the sense that if I have one action here which is less than the other, the corresponding generating sets satisfy this preorder in exactly the same way. OK? All right. And now the, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. About the actions, I, I know that you, you said it wasn't important for the rest of the Sure. Time, but is it, is it uh, simple to say what it means for one to be just the less than? Uh, you, could you have an action? that's less than another action? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is a preorder that goes with that equivalence okay. uh, relationship, but it's not something I need for the rest of the okay, talk. Worry, it corresponds to having a coarsely G equivariant large scale Lipschitz map from an orbit to another. Or in the case of co-bounded actions, just between the spaces, because one orbit is, is boundedly close from everything else. Okay. But yeah, yeah, there is a preorder which goes with that. Yep. All right. So now I, I'd like to define the other thing in 
the title of my talk, which was an acylindrical structure. But before I can do that, I need to tell you what an acylindrical structure is. So acylindricity is just another adjective that your action could be, right? An action can be co-bounded, proper, geometric. An action can be acylindrical. So here's the definition. G acting on S is acylindrical if, for every epsilon bigger than 0, there exists constants r and n bigger than 0, which only depend on epsilon and nothing else, such that for every pair of points in our space, and let me say d denotes the metric on S, which are sufficiently far apart, where r determines how far apart they should be, the number of elements of my group G that simultaneously move x and y close to each other has a uniform bound on it given by n. Now this definition is, is a bit technical and difficult to parse through if you're seeing it for the first time. Here's a picture that might help. We've got x and we've got y and they're at least distance r apart. And then I look at the epsilon balls around x and y in this metric space. And then I want to consider group elements that act in a way that g of x and g of y both land within these epsilon balls. And this action dictates that there can be uniformly, for the entire group acting on the space, at most n elements that do this. Okay? So for all but finitely many elements of your group, this is what the action looks like. If this moves a little, that moves a lot. So it kind of does that. And for only at most n elements can you have this moving close to each other. Okay. All right. And so now I can define what an acylindrical action is. Uh, so rather what an acylindrical structure is. An acylindrical structure on G is an equivalence class taken from H of G such that the corresponding action on this Cayley graph is acylindrical. So I'm looking at generating sets such that the corresponding Cayley graph is first of all hyperbolic, and the natural action of G on this Cayley graph is acylindrical. And it's again OK for me to put this adjective with one of these on one of these Cayley graphs, because given another generating set which is equivalent to x, I know there's a quasi-isometry between those spaces, but that quasi-isometry is actually going to be g equivariant. So if the group acts acylindrically on one Cayley graph, you can use the equivariance and push the action through onto the other Cayley graph and show that that has to be acylindrical too. Okay? Yeah. Cylinders. Yeah. Oh, it's just a name. So I think I think that I'm not sure what it has to do with cylinders, and I think, yeah. I mean, as far as I know, acylindricity. Yeah, acylindricity is a term that I think Sela defined for groups acting on trees and in general due to Bowditch. But but yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And the set of all acylindrical structures, which I will abbreviate in this way, is denoted by AH of G. And we consider the same preorder on it as induced from G of G. Now the focus of our work is essentially to try and understand these two structures, uh, in particular, I am interested in acylindrically hyperbolic groups, which are groups that admit non-elementary acylindrical actions on hyperbolic spaces. So for me, this structure is of particular significance. But because AH of G is a subset of H of G, it makes sense also to study the bigger picture. So how can we study these structures? <coughs> well, one thing that helps us understand H of G better is to use Gromov's classification 
of what happens when a group acts on a hyperbolic space. So there are no assumptions made about the type of action. It's just a group acting on a space. And Gromov's classification essentially has five possibilities, which translate directly here. You can have elliptic structures on your group. So they correspond to generating sets where your Cayley graph is a bounded diameter. Or you can have lineal structures on your group where the corresponding Cayley graph has exactly two points on your Gromov boundary. Or you have quasi-parabolic actions on your group. So the Gromov boundary has infinitely many points, and the entire group fixes one point on your boundary. So this is the kind of action that looks like this. And this is the point C on the Gromov boundary, which is fixed for every G in G, quasi-parabolic. And the last thing you can have are general type structures. OK? Can you say five? I am. I am. I'm going to get to it in a second. That's right. Our general type structures. So in this case, the Gromo boundary has infinitely many points, but there are no fixed points for the entire group action. OK? So a good example to think of a general structure is the action of the free group on its regular generating set. It's got infinitely many points, no fixed points in the Gromo boundary. Now, the reason I said five is because Gromo's classification gives you one more possibility. It says that a group acting on a hyperbolic space can be parabolic. And for what a parabolic action is that the orbits are bounded, and there is exactly one point in the Gromo boundary fixed under the entire group action. But what you can show is that a co-bounded action can never be parabolic. And because we consider generating sets for which the action on the Cayley graph is always co-bounded, parabolic structures never turn up here. Okay. All right. So how can we better understand these four individual structures? Well, the elliptic structures are easiest to understand. For any group, there's always just one. And this is the equivalence class of the generating set, which consists of every group element. Okay? Lineal structures are kind of surprising. For some groups, lineal structures are very, very easy to understand. For example, if your group is virtually cyclic, you can show that it has exactly one lineal structure that corresponding to the finite generating set of your group. And what you can also see is that a virtually cyclic group will never have quasi-parabolic or general type actions. Because consequences of having quasi-parabolic or general type actions result using the ping pong lemma. They imply that your group either has to have free sub semigroups or free subgroups. And that's not possible for a virtually cyclic group. So in particular, if G is virtually cyclic, we already know its H of G structure. It has the generating set corresponding to the entire group. And then it has the generating set, the equivalence class corresponding to a finite generating set. And so what the Haas diagram of this post set looks like is this, where this is G and this is X. Okay. We often refer to this elliptic structure as the trivial hyperbolic structure. It's not of any, per it's not of any particular s significance because it doesn't give us any good information about our group, but it does two things. The first thing it does is ensure that this post set we're talking about is always not empty. And the second thing it does is that it always ensures that there is a smallest element in our post set. So it makes sure that our post set is at least connected, like it's not disconnected, because everything can be joined to the trivial structure. OK. But regarding lineal structures in general, here's what we can show. For any group G, the following are true. First of all, the set of lineal structures of your group is an anti-chain, which means 
that if you have more than one element in your set of lineal structures, they're, er they're incomparable to each other. And if there's just one element in there, well, then that by itself is also an anti-chain. And secondly, um, the other theorem that we can show is that for every cardinal, there exists a group G with exactly that many lineal structures. And further, it has no quasi-parabolic or general type actions. Which means, in particular, for a natural number n, this is what the Haas diagram of the post set looks like. The Haas diagram consists of n non-equivalent lineal structures, because it's an anti-chain. And then you have the trivial structure, and each lineal structure is connected to your trivial structure. OK. Quasi-parabolic actions are still a little difficult to understand for us. And the reason is there aren't any good tools as of yet that we know of to understand these types of actions. The one thing we do know, however, is that if there is a quasi-parabolic action, then there is at least one lineal action. And the reason is, from a quasi-parabolic action, you can construct a Boseman quasi-character, which is a homomorphism up to bounded error. And then that homomorphism exactly tells you how to project your group elements onto a line. General type structures, at least for me, were perhaps the most surprising. And to see why they're the most surprising, let me go back to the example of the free group. Right, and we now know that its Cayley graph uh, is an infinite four valence tree that looks like this. Okay, where I take A over here and B over here. Now, what you can do in the free group is that you can systematically collapse infinite cyclic subgroups inside this Cayley graph. And when I say collapse, I mean you take the generating set which consists of the elements A, B, and then can, is there a question? OK. And then let's say, for example, I consider the element G, which is the product of A and B, and then I just take AB to the n for every n. So when I take this generating set, I can start with the Cayley graph on two generators. And then for every element in this infinite cyclic subgroup, I just add edges. So in particular, that entire infinite cyclic subgroup is now in the one neighborhood of the identity. Okay? And there is a lemma by Bowditch which tells you that if you do this a little bit carefully, then you can effectively just collapse this cyclic subgroup and nothing else. Which means in the resulting Cayley graph, I'll still have infinitely many ends on the Gromov boundary, and I still won't have any fixed points. And if you do this for different elements, what that does, as far as general type structures of the free group go, is that it generates a continuum many of them, or at least aleph not many. And this is surprising, because intuitively what it means is that if I have a general type structure of my group, then I can play ping pong on that general type structure by choosing two elements particularly carefully, generate the free group inside that group G, and then maybe do this collapsing process inside the free group and end up with many general type structures for the original group. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work out that way. And the reason is because elements need not be conjugate inside your free group, but they might be conjugate in the bigger group. And then there's a problem that when you collapse this subgroup, you might have actually collapsed a lot of the bigger group. So the theorem that we prove, which was very counterintuitive, is that for every natural number n, there exists a group G with exactly n general type structures. And it has no lineal structures or quasi-parabolic structures. 
In particular, its Haas diagram looks exactly like that. And that answers another question, which is a kind of isomorphism question. Can there be non-isomorphic groups that give you the same post-set st structure for your group as far as h of g goes? And the answer is yes. Obviously, the groups that you have from this theorem and this theorem are non-isomorphic. Otherwise, they'd have to behave in exactly the same way. But at least for natural numbers, their Haas diagrams look exactly the same. So I cannot distinguish between these groups simply by looking at this post-set structure. Can I yeah. Can you give me an example of a group of the, of the type in the lineal case with n equals 2? Um, here? Yeah. Take the infinite dihedral group cross of itself. And in fact, if you want for any natural number, and if you take n copies of the infinite dihedral group, it, it's going to give you exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah. And yeah, down here it must be more complicated. Yeah, down here it's a bit more complicated. You have, to, you have to play with the infinite symmetric group a little to get a subgroup which does what you want. It's a little more complicated over here. All right. So what this demonstrates to us is that h of g, at least, is a rather complicated thing to understand. And it's very sensitive, even to taking subgroups of finite index. Things change drastically. By contrast, if I want to study a h of g, that's a much better post-set for me to understand. And the reason is this theorem by Dennis Osen. So the theorem by Dennis Osen is the following. Let G be a group acting acylindrically on a hyperbolic space S, then exactly one of the following happen. The first thing that can happen is that G has bounded orbits, so the action is elliptic. The second thing that could happen is that G acts linearly. And this, in fact, only happens when G is virtually cyclic. And the last possibility is that G acts uh, with a general type action. So what acylindricity does is further that it completely rules out the possibility of having quasi-parabolic actions. And acylindrical actions are nice. And one immediate consequence of this theorem is the following theorem that we prove regarding the cardinality of the post-set A h of g. So for any group g, exactly one of the following is true. Either the cardinality of the set A h of g is 1, which means your group always acts elliptically for an acylindrical co-bounded action on a hyperbolic space, or the cardinality is 2. And this is equivalent to saying that G is virtually cyclic. And in the last case, you have that this cardinality is infinity. This is equivalent to G being acylindrically hyperbolic. And even worse, in this case, AH of G contains chains and antichains of cardinality continuum, which means I can find a continuum many structures in here, which are all pairwise incomparable. And I can also find a continuum many set of structures that, are, that form one long chain. So in this case, AH of G is really, really massive. It's, it's huge. The last thing I'd like to talk about today is the question of accessibility. And this section of the work is really motivated uh, by uh, Stallings' theorem on groups acting with infinitely many n's, as well as Dunwoody's accessibility theory. <coughs> so the definition is that a group G is said to be H accessible, or respectively, AH accessible, if the poset H of G or respectively, 
AH of G contains a largest element. Now, when I say a largest element, an element in my structure that dominates every other structure in this post set. Right, we've already seen that a smallest structure exists for any group G. That's the trivial hyperbolic structure. But whether or not our largest one exists, it need not be true. For example, for H of G, if this is the group that I have with that Haas diagram, it doesn't have a largest structure, right? There's nothing sitting above any of those lineal structures. So that's a group which doesn't have a largest element. So when can we say, first of all, that a group is H accessible or AH accessible? How do we know? And secondly, are there some nice groups for which we know this property is true? And a more natural question to ask would be, is there any relation between being H accessible and AH accessible, right? One's a post set inside of the other. Unfortunately, the answer to this last question is there's no relation whatsoever, OK? For example, if I take a virtually cyclic group, right? It's H accessible that I can see from this diagram. It's also AH accessible because the Haas diagram for the AH structure of this group is exactly the same. So it's both H accessible and AH accessible. By contrast, if I take the group Z squared and I apply this theorem to it, I know Z squared is not virtually cyclic. It can't act linearly. I also know it can't have a general type action because it doesn't have the free group as a subgroup. So in any acylindrical action, it, it's always forced to act elliptically. So for z squared, this is exactly one point. So it's AH accessible trivially. However, the H structure of z squared looks like this. It's got continuum many lineal actions. And then there's one trivial structure. And how you get those continuum many lineal actions for z squared is in the following way. What you do is that you fix your identity in this grid. And then you take lines of slope r, where r can be any real number. And what you do is that you force an element a, b to act by translation along this line where the translation number is determined by its distance to the line. So elements that are further away act with greater shift. Elements that are closer act with smaller shift. And now what happens when you take two different lines of different slopes, which run through the identity, is that I can always find a sequence of points that are somehow very close to this line. Say they're in the one neighborhood of this line. But they get arbitrarily far from the other. So their translation lens with respect to one of these lines is always bounded. It's less than 1. But for the other line, they get arbitrarily large. And that's exactly the sort of phenomenon that violates being coarsely g equivalently quasi-isometric. And that's why you get a continuum many, because you get as many actions as there are slopes, and you have a continuum many worth of slopes. OK, so that's a group which is AH accessible, but not H accessible. We also have it the other way around. Dunwoody's inaccessible group is H accessible, but not AH accessible. And then there are groups which are neither. If you use the Ripsis construction, you can get a non-hyperbolic group sitting inside a hyperbolic group where the quotient is z. This is a short exact sequence. And this group H is neither H accessible nor AH accessible. Even worse, if you use Brady's construction, you can make this H finitely presented, which is even worse, because that's very counterintuitive. So the phenomenon of actually being H accessible is not that, of being H inaccessible is not that uncommon. Even well-known groups are H inaccessible, like z squared. But on the other hand, this theorem ensures that AH accessibility behaves much, much more nicely. So the theorem is that the following classes of groups are AH accessible. So we've got mapping class groups, right angled Artin group, and then you have fundamental groups of compact 
orientable. Is there a question? Three manifolds um, with either empty or toroidal boundary. And these are actually all acylindrically hyperbolic groups. So acylindrical hypercity behaves well with groups. Now there are tons of open questions here. One very natural question to ask is, are there some graphs that are forbidden from appearing as the Haas diagram for the HG or the AH of G structure for a group? I know that I can't have a disconnected set, but apart from that, can I say anything? I don't know. The other question you could ask is something that I don't know about AH accessibility yet, is how it behaves with finite index subgroups. So I've got a group G. I have H, which is finite index in G. And I know G is AH accessible. Do I know that it behaves well enough to say that H also has to be AH accessible, even if its accessibility is realized with the trivial structure? That's OK. But I don't know that as of yet. And as broader questions go, both H of G and AH of G so far are just posets. When are they a lattice? And given two structures in these posets, is there a systematic way of building a larger or a smaller action? Right? I don't know if I have two generating sets and I take the union. All I know is that, is that it's still a generating set. I don't know if the corresponding Cayley graph is hyperbolic or if the action is even acylindrical. And I certainly don't know how to get a smaller action, because the intersection of those two generating sets may not even be a generating set anymore. And lastly, which is of particular interest to me, is that it's known that out of Fn is an acylindrically hyperbolic group. And what I'd like to know is that if it's AH accessible. But that's something that I don't know as of now. And the primary obstruction to, to knowing that is that we don't know a good space on which out of Fn acts acylindrically. We know one exists. But it's not a good space in which you can get a handle. For these groups, they're very easy. For mapping class groups, it's the action on the curve complex that you can study. And for rags, it's the action on the extension graph. And for most compact three manifolds, you can study the action on the Bastet tree. But for out of Fn, because I don't know a good space, which is easily understandable, I still don't know if it's AH accessible. That's all I had to say. Thank you.